anyone who has read the Bible, even a little, knows that there are passages that can make the heart sore and passages that make the heart sink. Texts that comfort you and texts that terrorize you. Stories that fill you with hope and stories that cause you to despair. And if I had a top ten list of such passages that make our hearts sink, scare us, cause us to despair, then our gospel reading for today would be on it. The story of Jesus calling his first disciples would be near the top of the list. But that's not the way the story was meant. It was meant to encourage readers to follow, to inspire faith in others, move people toward discipleship. But most people despair when they hear the story because they think if that's the way it really was, if those first disciples just up and left everything behind, job, wife, children, parents, security, and all the rest, then there's no hope for them. Because they haven't, can't, won't. So it's a story that often leaves people feeling judged, faithless, anything but a true disciple. So what are we to do with such stories? Is there anything in them to encourage us? Well, maybe we need to hear them in a new way. Now, the way we usually hear the stories is to hear them as stories about the first disciples. And what gets us is that there were no thought, no anguish, no struggling, or wrestling with their decision. They just did it. And immediately the questions come. Did, did Mark and Luke and Matthew maybe leave something out in order to make the point? And anyway, what did Simon Peter's wife have to say about it? Being left with the kids and her sick mother. And what did the father of James and John feel when they just sauntered off leaving him behind to run the business by himself? Of course, Luke tries to help us out a bit by saying that unlike Mark and Matthew, Simon at least had some previous contact with Jesus and witnessed his miracles of healing. And Luke also says, unlike Mark and Matthew do, that Jesus did another miracle of sorts before calling Simon and the others to follow. But still, even Luke says, they just up and went. But if that's the way it really was, we think, then there's little or no hope for us because we anguish over everything. And we continue to anguish and second guess ourselves and look back long after we've made a decision because well, as one author suggested, it's the way we have of trying to gain God's approval. If God sees us sweating it out, torn within ourselves, pouring over long lists of pros and cons and praying long prayers, taking our time, analyzing every option, then surely God must know that somehow we are serious people and we deserve his approval. And maybe such seriousness will even move God to grant us success, reward us for being so hard thinking, hard working. And if it turns out to be a bad decision, then all we put into it will surely move God to overlook the mistake and forgive us. But we think it's the only way big decisions can turn out to be good decisions and even give us a second chance. So we want the disciples to be like us so that we can be disciples like them. If they didn't anguish over their decision, how will we ever be able to truly be a disciple? Of course, some people have an explanation for the disciples' immediate response. The disciples didn't wrestle with their decision, they say, because the disciples had such great faith and courage. But that doesn't help much either. If anything, it makes it worse. Because then we find ourselves thinking that we could probably never muster such faith and courage as that. Not leave everything behind as they did. 
I mean, let's face it, we can't even take an overnight trip without taking half the house with us. <laughs> in carry-on bags, no less. So how can we ever leave behind our precious life, our precious things? No thought, no misgivings, and head off to what God knew where? If being a disciple requires that kind of faith and courage, then many of us will conclude that we have no hope of ever being a real disciple. The truth is, if these stories are about the disciples, then we're in trouble. And yet, what if the stories aren't about the disciples, or faith, or courage, but something else? But what? Well, as one commentator suggested, actually, they're stories about God, not the disciples, or us. They are stories about what God can do, not what the disciples did or what we can do. They're not stories about the disciples or us choosing God, but God choosing them and us more than anything. They're miracle stories. I mean, think about it. In Mark and Matthew, Jesus is walking along one day and spots a couple of fishermen casting their nets into the sea. And a little later, he sees a couple of fishermen mending their nets in a boat. These fishermen have never laid his eyes on him before or even heard of him. There's nothing to indicate. They were even religious men. And certainly as fishermen, they weren't looking to be a rabbi's followers. Nor would they expect a rabbi to want to, them to be his followers. All we know is they were everyday fishermen trying to earn a living. And while the circumstances are a bit different in Luke, the situation of the fishermen are pretty much the same. And suddenly, out of the blue, Jesus says, follow me. And they do. That's the miracle. No anguish, no wrestling, no saying, well, let me study my options and I'll get back to you. Or let me run this by my wife and kids and hey, I'll let you know. No negotiating a long-term contract with health benefits either. And no profound statement of faith or long torture prayers. Nothing. They just put one foot in front of the other and they go. In the miracle stories, Jesus simply tells the crippled man to get up and walk. Or applies mud to the eyes of a blind man and suddenly the man sees. Or takes a dead child by the hand and tells her to arise. All the emphasis is on the power of God at work in Jesus. And even when the faith of someone is mentioned, it's not the person's faith that works the healing, but the power of God, the openness. Faith is the openness to God's power, not power in itself. And that's what we see in the story of the call of the disciples. The power of God to create faith where there was no faith, to put courage where there was no courage, to make disciples where there were no disciples. To get them to just put one foot in front of the other and see what happens. Or you can think about it like this. The disciples fell in love with Jesus on the spot. And all it took was a New York minute to decide to marry themselves to him. It was love at first sight. And like people who are crazy in love, all they saw was the one they loved thought about nothing else, didn't worry about the future or what anyone would say. Being with the one they loved was all that mattered. And what once mattered, mattered no longer. And they were willing to change jobs, move, go to the ends of the earth, if that's what it took to be together. And the miracle of God worked was giving them the faith to do it. And if that's the way it was, then actually, there's hope for us because we're capable of such love at any age. Maybe it's some person or some project or some ministry. It's like falling in love. Or maybe it's some need that cries out to us and we know we must respond. Do something. Or maybe it's some need within ourselves. And what the story tells us is that we don't have to worry about having faith or courage enough. God will create that within us. Nor do we need to worry about if we know in an instant what we must do. We can trust that. 
All we truly need to do is to allow ourselves to fall in love and be open to the miracle of it all. But yet, mm, what about that business of leaving everything behind? Well, as that author I've referred to says, maybe we make too much out of that. Some of the disciples did leave much behind, but some didn't. And maybe some were ready to leave it all anyway. Following, though, doesn't always mean leaving everything behind. Is that author right? Sometimes following may mean staying at home. It may mean letting the hired servants go and take care of Zebedee when he gets too old to fish. Sometimes following may mean casting the same old nets in a new way or for new reasons. Or it may mean doing something different with the fish you catch. Or spending the money they bring to the market in a different way. May mean reorganizing the whole fishing business so that the drifters down at the pier have work to do. It may mean actually doing less every day, not more, so that there is time to watch how the light changes on the water and how the happy fish leap out of it at dusk. Happy to have outsmarted you one more time. There are endless possibilities for following. Something different for each of us in our own particular lives at a particular time. And by the way, for those of us who are, well, let's say, getting up there, getting a little long in tooth, getting rather ripe, uh, this is good to know. Because it means we can follow at any age, still be a disciple at any age, and keep following. Because who knows what it will mean at each particular time in our lives. What we know that is certain is whatever it may mean, at whatever age we are, God will create within us what we need to follow and what it takes to be a disciple. Of course, none of this may be the real problem with his stories. Maybe the real problem is they're rather scary stories. Simon Peter was scared, that's for sure. And what scared him, to use somebody else's words, was the net bursting success he and the others experienced in the presence of Jesus and through the power of Jesus. Peter was far more comfortable with the familiar, limited reality he had always known, toiling all the and catching nothing, meager, meager success here and there, but mostly failure. What scared him was the stunning new reality experience with Jesus. As a matter of fact, he was so frightened, so frightened of what it might mean for him and his life that he told Jesus to go away. Actually, literally, to get out of the neighborhood. And maybe that's the real problem. Being scared, being afraid, that we might just fall in love, leave behind what is kind of familiar and certain, Maybe we're stepping out into what's unknown. Even at the age some of us are. Abandon self-doubts and cautiousness and actually use our gifts and abilities to the fullest and to see some net-bursting success as we allow God to give us the faith and courage we need. And in fact, they are scary stories because they tell us that what we perhaps hope is impossible is not impossible at all in the power of God, and that we can be that disciple. And maybe that's finally the miracle God works in us, setting us free from our fear. Not our fear of being disciples, failing as disciples, but our fear of succeeding as disciples. So maybe the stories can encourage us after all. Encourage us to trust, to trust God's power, to put one foot in front of the other and see what happens. Amen. Amen.